Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to today's session. Yesterday, we have very impressive presentation from different speakers. Today, we will be starting another day where we, we believe that we will still have impressive presentations from our speakers. And to kick off this day today, I want to say thank you for those who were in attendance. Thank you for everybody who wanted to share knowledge and information with the speakers yesterday. I am very grateful to, for, for, your, for your attendance. And as I said, today we will start. And our first speaker today is Pedro Correa. Pedro Correa is from Portugal, and he will give us the impact on governance. I mean, the impact of governance principle on sport organizations, practices, and performances. Pedro has worked for different organizations or is consulting for different uh, ex uh, uh, organizations especially that he's an international consultant. He's consulting for UEFA, for uh, organizations like UEFA and FIFA at the moment, and FIBA at, at, at the moment. And I am very glad that Pedro has started some work with the Botswana Premier League uh, as an assignment from UEFA that is doing with the Botswana Premier League. So probably, if you need to get in touch with Pedro, you can contact us at Info at Stylistics Portainment so that he can help you in whatever he, he want help in because he's still going to talk about governance issues. Yesterday when Mr. Mamelodi was presenting, he left a lot of things to say. Pedro will, will, will touch on those issues because he was speaking on sports leadership. And sports leadership is quite dif difficult to separate from governance in sport. So this is what Pedro will do. I think the, the gaps that Ashford left behind, Pedro will, will, will have to fill them in. So thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you for agreeing to speak at the summit. I welcome you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the introduction, Tabo. If we can put up the presentation, and I will also speak a little bit about myself. So as Tavo was mentioning, uh, the session for today, it's about the impact of governance principles on sports organization governance practices and performance. Um, what I'm going to present uh, uh, actually applies to a different range of sports, you know. I'm talking more about federations, about leagues. I will use the example of football because it's where I have more experience. But as I said, uh, I think that most of these uh, uh, concepts of the content will be transversal to different sports. So now a little bit about myself, what Tabo was saying. Uh, I started working in, uh, in events and sports over 20 years ago. Started with a very political event, the handover of Macau to China and transition to, to football, to, to UEFA, to European Championships. So I was organizing, I was organizing in a four-year cycle different, uh, different European Championships and, and competitions. I had also the opportunity to work on five World Cups. And I did, uh, I did uh, uh, in Asia the AFC Asian Cup. I, I did in London the Summer Olympic Games, the Rugby World Cup, and, uh, and, different, uh, and different other events. Uh, at a certain moment, after traveling for around uh, 23 years, I decided to, to come back to my home country and I was uh, on the league, I was Secretary General uh, for two years. At this moment, uh, I'm working more on a freelancer on a consulting basis and uh, as Tabo mentioned, uh, I'm working for FIFA, um, for, different, uh, for different departments within FIFA, for UEFA, also different programs. FIBA, the FIBA Plus program, so more uh, strategy, strategic plan development, and then uh, and then different uh, different other organizations, namely CIES and some universities 
where I lecture and I also try to pass some of the knowledge acquired. So going into the, into the topic of today, there are a few questions, you know, in, in half an hour, it's, uh, it's only possible to give a brief idea of, uh, let's say, the main topics. But there are lots of questions around and we could speak for, for, for many hours. One of the questions would be, what is the importance of good governance in, in general? And how would it be adapted, you know, during the development of a sports organization? I've seen recently from, uh, from, my, from my colleague Jeff Wilson, I've seen recently uh, a study that uh, says that, uh, um, identifies that almost two thirds of uh, uh, the sports organizations do not use data to make their decisions. This is, I, I don't think that it's surprising in, uh, in sports. Uh, I think that uh, the situation is improving. I think that more and more uh, organizations, this type of organizations are trying to seek for data to uh, base their decisions on, okay? And to, um, let's say, and to take better, better decisions in general. But this is something that uh, is, a, is a highlight in terms of the situation that we have, uh, that we have today. What is the need for good governance in sport organizations? Well, we have seen different, uh, in different sports, we have seen different, uh, different topics coming up, uh, match fixing, we have uh, the child safeguarding, we have uh, issues that we have seen of corruption. In other cases, in other sports, it's more the, the, the plague of doping. So uh, there are different, uh, there are different problems. Um, there are different problems surrounding sports. And there are different ways of trying to tackle this. And governance is one of the experts. Characteristics of good governance. I would highlight here, I would highlight here from my experience, nine, nine different aspects. Independency. Uh, you need to have, uh, you need to have uh, bodies and you need to have decisions that are equitable and inclusive. You need to have people that are accountable. You need to have uh, an ethical approach. It needs to be a, a transparent uh, uh, process, you know, a transparent approach. Uh, responsive versus, uh, versus uh, let's say, reactive. Uh, effective versus efficiency. It needs to be fair. And it needs to be considered as creating value. So we are not looking for red tape. We are not looking for administration. But the governance aspects need to create value for the organization. So in the end, if I would sum, it's basically a pact of trust between the organization and its different stakeholders. This is probably the most important uh, characteristic. Now, if I look, as I said, as I said, I would, uh, I would base my examples more coming from football as a sport. The first, uh, the first guiding principles in football are the statutes of FIFA that uh, already give to its member associations some guidelines, some guidance on what needs to be their governance. So the statutes of the member associations need somehow to be in line with uh, the FIFA statutes. So this is clearly a reference. If I go, if I go now to a confederation, so a level lower, um, I have here the example of UEFA that uh, formalized uh, in one of its congresses the 10 principles of good governance and expects the 55 associations to implement it in a certain way. The 10 principles that UEFA has put forward is the need to have a strategy. So the, the, um, the associations, they need to understand where they are now and where they would like to go in a, in a time horizon of three, four, five years. They need to have statutes and they need to be in line, obviously, with UEFA and with FIFA. It is important to have stakeholder in, uh, uh, involvement. So not to manage football in a silo, but to try to bring the different stakeholders to the table. Then the other aspects already mentioned, the promotion of values like ethical, ethical values, integrity, and uh, what is considered good governance. This means, in a way, professionalization of committee structures. So moving a little bit uh, to, uh, to more professional people uh, instead of being only volunteers. 
the administrative processes inside the, the inside the federations okay the definition of all the processes and procedures the accountability so we need to make people responsible for their acts uh, a volunteer program so even if we are professionalizing some of the committee structures it's still for many associations it's still important to have a volunteer program you know people that give their time that give their enthusiasm for the good of football this is especially in small and medium uh let's say federations this is extremely important and then finally transparency so to be uh, especially to to the key stakeholders to the public and then compliance okay so making sure that what is put in place uh, in fact uh, is being uh, let's say followed so what is the typical structure in football and i think that in other federations it will be something similar at the top uh, we have uh, obviously the law of the land which is specific to each country and then uh, the federations are subject to fifa rules and then the confederation the specific confederation rules inside the federation obviously um the association will have a general assembly and it will have uh, its own rules based on the statutes and other types of regulations uh there will be an executive committee or a board the the depends a little bit on the terminology that is used uh, standing committees and then a general secretary that is normally uh, managing let's say the executive management team so the administration of the federation in terms of membership, uh, the federations, the members of the federations are normally the regional associations, in some cases the clubs, and also in some situations also other affiliated bodies like, uh, I don't know, a referees association, a players association, a, a, a coaches association, okay, different possibilities. And in some cases, in some sports, uh, so not only in football, there are different league organizations that are still a member. They are always subordinate to the federation in the country. So in, a, in a nutshell, this is the macro governance structure, the typical structure in football, and I believe that in many of the other federations. Now, when we are talking about these macro governance aspects, uh, there is the question of uh, the composition of the General Assembly, the composition, the, the representation on the board or in the executive committee of the different stakeholders, so the regional associations, the, the clubs, for instance, and then other bodies, you know, and standing committees that might exist. So this, uh, this forms the overall, uh, let's say, macro structure of uh, the federation. Then, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of management, do we have a president, general, secretary, type of management do you have something that is more business oriented ceo coo there are also different examples of uh, federations and leagues that follow uh, let's say different approaches as i mentioned the representation of the of the clubs the stakeholder management so what is the what are the principles of uh, the relationship uh, with other uh, key bodies you know like players association coaches especially the, the referee association uh, and others the operational structure so this is also very much linked uh, let's say with the strategy so the operational the structure should follow in a way the strategy that is defined should be adapted in order to to implement the plan the overarching documentation so the statutes maybe a memorandum of, of understanding between federations and leagues the different regulations that exist and then going to the lowest going to the to the micro level obviously the internal policies and procedures so all of these aspects are what i would call the macro considerations in governance of uh, a sports organization now when we are talking when we are talking about an environment that we have a federation uh, and league so again we start from the general sports law then we have uh, uh, the, the league statutes and probably a very important document, which is a memorandum of understanding between the league and the federation, because the league is implementing, um, the, let's say, the responsibilities that are delegated by the federation. The league is affiliated to a federation. And this is something uh, that is very important to understand from a, a governance point of view. Then um, there could be different possibilities, but normally we would find different types of regulations. 
we can find general regulations that usually um, further specify the statutes. We can have a competition regulations, referee regulations, disciplinary, a club licensing system, an ethics code, and so on. So some, some of the federations might have less, others might have a little bit more. The next step is translating these regulations into day-to-day -day manuals. So we might be talking about match commissioners, we might be talking about the broadcasting manual, operations, stadium inspections, and so on. So this is a level more detailed, more down-to-earth, uh, operational for people to operate. And then, obviously, another aspect is the communication with the so-called uh, the so-called uh, stakeholders. And there are normally two different possibilities. One is the official communication, which is uh, basically open to the public, to the media, normally in websites and so on, you know, following a transparency approach. And then you have other, uh, other, other formats, which are circular letters, which normally is more to the football family. So it's more internal to the, to the key stakeholders. It's not public. It doesn't go out. This gives us an idea from, let's say, from a documentation point of view, from a regulation, a direction point of view, what kind of, uh, what kind of elements we, we will have. Now, when we are, when we are saying how to, run, how to run the game or how to run the sports, we have clearly the statutes, the structures, which is how do you make the decisions. Then uh, there should be a focus on processes. Processes means how this sports federation does the things in the right order. So this is something that should be determined because it's linked, obviously, with the efficiency. The systems. The systems is more related on how to gather data, how to gather information. Remember what I said in the beginning that uh, um, still many organizations nowadays, they don't base... Uh, uh their decisions on objective data and they don't do this because they have difficulties in gathering this data then procedures and guidelines basically here this type of documentation is to try to um try to assert and try to define behavior of certain stakeholders how, how do you expect them to behave behave vis-a-vis -vis the federation and then the last is the reporting element this is a, a very important element of governance and how to run the, the, the sports because it's linked with transparency and how to share information to whom, in which format, in which platform, and so on. So these are all considerations that you should have. I go now before uh, the last elements is uh, to explain something that is common sense but in the end, many organizations have a difficulty in understanding and putting and implementing and putting forward. So we are talking here about the strategic and operational cycles. Strategic planning uh, is normally a function of a board of an executive committee. And at this level, what should what should the members um, what should the members focus on? Well, the first element in a graphical way, it's basically the meaning of strategy. It's where you are at the moment, your current situation, and how, what is your vision? So where do you want to be in a certain number of years? And how do you get there? How do you do this? You do this in four different phases normally. An assessment, so exactly internal and external assessment to identify where you are at the moment. The strategy, in the end, is defined by a vision, mission, values, goals, and objectives. And basically it expresses where do you want to go, you know, going forward to the, to the vision. Implementation, it implies basically a strategic or an operational plan. It implies the allocation of resources. It implies allocation of budgets. It implies a certain structure, responsibilities, uh, uh, time-bound, uh, uh, let's say, objectives and so forward. So putting a plan up. But the plan is not enough. It needs to be monitored. And the monitoring needs to be done at the strategic level. So it's basically, it's basically identifying, are we getting there? Do we, need to change, uh, do we need to change something? What decisions do we need to take in this case? 
And the output of all this, uh, of all of this exercise, is what we call the strategic house model. That in the end, you know, you have the vision, mission, you have the values, the goals, which are let's say the pillars, and then underneath this, you will have objectives and you will have activities. Okay, but at the strategic level, it's it's basically the identification of the goals and this uh, strategy, uh, let's say, statement. Now, at the operational level, so normally managed by the general secretary, there you need to implement basically the strategic plan. And a strategic plan, the difference with an operational plan is normally the length. A strategic plan is for three, four, five years, an operational plan is yearly. So if you have a, a strategy of four years, you need four, operation, four yearly operational plans. How does it work? The operational plan should be established by the administration of the Federation. It needs to be aligned with the budget. This is something that is quite, uh, uh, quite important and not always happens. Uh, you have uh, what is called a PDCA cycle. So when you are doing the implementation, you plan, you do, meaning implement, you check if the implementation is going well, and you act if you need to do corrective measures along, uh, let's say, along the, the, along the year. And uh, honestly, I've never seen a plan that doesn't have changes. At the end of the year, what, uh, what is supposed to happen? It's supposed that uh, this sports organization has uh, um, the year-end financial accounts, which should be closely aligned with an activity report. So basically saying what has been done throughout the year. And very important, you need to compare the year-end financial accounts with your operational budget and the activity report with the operational plan. So here you are actually doing an evaluation of your performance. Were you efficient? Did you implement what was set in the operational plan? And did you implement it within a certain budget? So this comparison and evaluation is very important. So in a nutshell, this is the difference between the operational planning cycle, which is at the management administration level, and the strategic, the strategic cycle, which is more, let's say, at the board, at the executive committee level. Now, we have mentioned uh, about uh, um, definition of uh, internal guidelines. So we are talking about the operational policies and procedures. Okay, and this is an example. This is an example of different elements that. Uh, I would expect, if I do an organizational review in a sports organization, that I would expect uh, to find, okay? So from a staff manual to statutory obligations, maybe, maybe a, a code of conduct, contract management, document retention and protection policies, uh, financial and budgeting, uh, let's say, policies and procedures, a delegation of authority metrics, so who authorizes the expenses, the contracts, the payments, and so on, which is very closely linked with procurement. You might find IT and communications guidelines. You might find internet and social media usage, headquarters, you know, related to security, related to um, working times, whatever, whatever elements are necessary and make sense. Event management, you know, some guidelines on how to organize the events, who participates, who has the responsibilities, and eventually other guidelines. So this is a snapshot and it's a part, uh, it's an integral part uh, of the internal governance aspects of a sports organization. Now, finally, uh, basically uh, you have then the element of compliance. It's, it's very nice uh, to have documentation, but uh, it, needs, it needs to be properly implemented. So basically in compliance, it's the ability of any sport organization to conform on the one hand side with the laws of the land, but also with the different regulations governing its business, either, either uh, internal regulations or external regulations, okay? So the concept covers um, all, the internal, uh, all the internal rules and policies, okay? And basically needs to check if there are controls and if the organization is following exactly what is prescribed, okay? So we have here, we have here, obviously, some examples, and uh, there can be other aspects. But the compliance function is quite important and could avoid many problems in the future. Well, 
Uh, this was the, the short presentation. We have, uh, we have a few minutes for, for questions. I thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward now to see if there are questions. Thank you so much. Well, there, are, there seem to be no questions. So uh, I thank you again very much for your, um, for your attention and uh, see you next time. Thank you.